Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Pray, Lord God, that you will open up this word to us. Pray you will speak to us by your spirit, Father. I ask, Lord God, Father, that you will open up our ears and, Father, open up our eyes that we might see that which is unseen and hear the still small voice of the living God. Amen. Praise God. Just going to read the first four verses and then we'll unpack this a little bit this morning. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? In fact, verse one, it says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? From plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Sounds very much like the day that we are living in just now, isn't it? Where perverse judgments seem to be the order of the day and more and more of them keep coming out. This wasn't quite the word I had this morning, actually. This case came in the early hours when I came down here a bit earlier. Can I get sidetracked slightly? And, um, and this word kind of opened up to me, so I've just went with it. You see, Habakkuk lived in during a time of great wickedness and apostasy in the land of Judea in the southern kingdom of Israel. Don't forget, the northern kingdom had been conquered and um, by the Azarians. We now seen there was going to be a rise of a new power of the day, which was the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, it might say in your Bible. And, um, but before that was coming, Israel and the, the, in the south of Israel, which was Jude, Judah, they, were, they, were, they were, became apostate. They were wicked. The people were turning away from God. All kinds of evil and corruption was taking place. You can read that in some of the major prophets and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, to tell you about the things that was going on. Look what they're doing. People had abandoned the worship of God. They were worshiping all these false gods. And wickedness was the order of the day. People had turned away completely from God. Yes, there was always a remnant. There were some faithful priests. Habakkuk was one of the faithful prophets. But there's many false prophets saying, everything's, why, everything's well, everything's wonderful. Don't don't worry about it, everything's okay. And, uh, and they just thought their life was going to continue like that. But they didn't realize that the God of heaven actually was going to be pouring out his judgment. It's a little bit that the days probably that we're living in just now. Everybody's just living as if there's going to be no tomorrow. Everything's going to be just the same. It's going to be the same. Everything's going to be fine. I want to tell you this, is, there is trouble coming to this world because the God of glory is going to come back and he's going to judge this world for its wickedness and everyone will be held accountable. So we see that priests and prophets alike had turned away from the Lord and all kinds of debauchery. Apostasy, many people were turning away from the faith. Like never before, we live in a culture, not just here in Scotland, but I would say right across, especially the Western nations, America, across Europe. We're seeing a great number of people turning away from the church in droves. I've seen many people that I used to worship with over the years no longer are worshiping the Lord. They're out there in the world and um, they've turned their backs on the Lord. Like never before, I, I just find it sad, especially when you could be so close to the end that you would actually get caught up in the world. And the world will just suck you in and spit you back out again. I want to tell you that. You might think the world's a wonderful place. People run away to remember the bright lights of London and we go down there. I want to tell you, there's nothing bright about the bright lights of London. Sorry if you're from London today, um, but this is, I don't think the lights are quite bright, so bright in Glasgow. And, um, but it's the same spirit, isn't it? You can get drawn into it, sucked into it, and it can just take you right off course from the Lord. And then the things of God just become boring and indifferent. And that's what we're seeing. The world is sparkling, isn't it? It's like the prodigal son, he get caught up, he looked across and he seen the bright lights and he get fed up being in his father's house and says, I'm, I'm fed up being in here. Everybody looks as if they're having fun over there, dancing and swinging around in the world. And it's only once you get caught up in it. It can take you a little bit to get fed up with it, but there's, what can this world offer to us? Hallelujah. God is, gives us everything we need. We just need to be faithful and stay committed. So not only was Habakkuk seeing all the wickedness 
but he had a burden and he was carrying that before the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Thank God for those who here carry the heart of God. And we say that, it says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So God had placed a burden on this man. He's seen it. He was, he was torn up inside. This wasn't just a bad week or a bad month. This was years. There was years where God's patience was given and, and God seemed to just restrain himself. And it just seemed to go from bad to worse to us. And Habakkuk now is living in the midst of it and his heart's breaking. He's looking at all and he says, God, when are you going to come and judge this? When are you going to come and, and, and deal with all of this sin? Father, surely you need to intervene and stop the people going down this particular road. And so he's carrying that burden and he cries. He's crying out to the Lord as we have just read there. Everywhere he looked, he just seen this wickedness and corruption and his heart is burdened for it. I need to pray more that God will give us a burden and when we look around and we see things, it's so easy just to get absorbed and then you just take it as a norm. You just see it as, well, well, that's just life, isn't it? 21st century, what else can we expect? It's not the 19th century anymore, you know. It's like, let your hair down, let's enjoy ourselves. And, you know, we're all God's children and come on, grace, 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 brother. Just live any way you want. It's all good grace of God. It doesn't quite work that way. We've been called to live in a certain way, to walk according to this word. God's called us to live holy lives. That's what my Bible says. Your Bible might say something else, but it might be your definition. What does holiness mean? What does it mean to walk in holiness and righteousness? Hallelujah. We maybe need to look at that a little bit further on. So he's carrying this burden. And again, I just want to say, listen, Friday night was special in, in this church, the, the, the Friday night prayer meeting. That's me back in Wednesday and Friday night, and it just it was it was busy next door, and there was just a sense there we were crying out to God. You, you ever get those moments when you know you're talking and you, and you just know that you're talking to the Lord? I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes you know when you're praying, sometimes you know it's you know it's you sometimes feel as if your prayers are bouncing off the ceilings. But then we, we reject that, isn't it? Because God is faithful and just. It's not how I feel about it. It's how because I'm there. I'm, I'm in the place of prayer. Whether I feel like it or don't, I'm in the place of prayer. And God hears our prayers. Anybody would like to just silence and say, like you're wasting your time. No, we are not wasting our time. Hallelujah. We have a God in heaven and our prayers. The Bible says God catches our prayers and they are being held like incense. In fact, in Revelation it says the prayers are going to be coming out and they're being offered up before the Lord. Glory to God. Every prayer is captured. Every tear is captured in his bottles. I don't know what that looks like. and um, But it's special, isn't it? So God sees these things. They're special to him. And they are recorded. So we have to keep forward, moving and moving and moving. So we can see here, there's Habakkuk. He's living in the midst of Judah, uh, Judea. And, um, and he's seen all, all of this wickedness going about him. And yet, so many people are fast asleep. I've got down here, much of the church is fast asleep and more burdened by the things of the world than the things of God. Let's be honest. Well, I'm, I'm so much more worried about the things of the world, but am I really, really concerned about the things of God? Am I really breaking my heart because of the, the, the carnage that is before me? Or is the more I'm burdened and it's really the things of the world that I'm really burdened for rather than the things of God? So the question is, I've been, you know, I don't just sit about in an island soaking up the sun, although I did get a good bit of sun, and, um, but I still contemplate a lot of things and um, when I'm over there as well and, you know, just getting that burden. I says, Father, you need to give me a greater burden again for the land of Scotland. I know I've had it and times have passed. I know I've still got it, but I need to intensify that. Does that make, does that make sense? It's a little bit when you're, you've got a fire going and it starts to go out a little bit. What you got to do? Fling another log in the fire. You need to throw more wood onto it to throw that, get that fire up again, get it back up to where it was. And that's a little bit like us again. We need, to, we need to just build ourselves up again and get that fire of God again within our very bellies. Hallelujah. I love that with Jeremiah. He says, oh, when I, he says, I tried to stay quiet, but I can't. Your word is like a fire within me. I've got to open up my mouth and I have to let it go out. Hallelujah. I need to speak because I cannot contain it because it's building up on me. And we need to get back to there as well. It's the only hope for our nation. You remember that expression, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so, you, ever that, so, you ever get fed up, you know, kind of swimming against the tide? You ever, you ever get fed up, you know, just banging your head against a brick wall? There's an expression that says, if you can't beat them, you might as well just join them. And that doesn't mean to say, I need to agree with them, but I just get fed up. Fine. I just, oh, let's just go with the flow. <laughs> just go with the flow. Why swim against the flow? Look, what's the point? And even though I might not agree with the flow, but I can get caught up in the flow. And, and so I've, I've joined them. 
Do you know that's probably a very good word for the church today? We're seeing some terrible things taking place. I could throw up the Church of England and the things that's taking place there, but we could throw up the Church of Scotland. We could, is, is there a Church of Wales uh, or the Church of Ireland? We could, they're all the same. They're, they're, we're talking about the bigger denominations, not every individual church, but we're seeing the church going a certain way now where we are now just getting caught up in the, the tide of the world and we're going along with the world and the world's values. Now, we're, look, we're fed up trying to fight this, so now we end up endorsing it. So we want, let's not speak about sexualized matters. Let's just, let's just look, let's just endorse a lot of stuff and we're seeing a lot of stuff being uh, adopted into the church now that would make our covenant and father's hair curl in their graves when we see all of the stuff that is taking place. So if you can't beat them, that means just say, you might as well join them. This seems to be the way of many people. As someone says, why rock the boat? You <laughs> get fed up and you go, why, look, why rock the boat? Just be quiet. Just keep still. That's what the spirit of the world says. Don't rock the boat, just be still. Look, don't rock the boat. When you start rocking the boat, then there's trouble coming to you. And we're seeing that more and more, isn't it? So if you, you stand up and say something, there's trouble coming to your door and you can immediately find you're going to be attacked. Stuart has is a, is, is, is got a great testament of that. Stuart's going to be speaking next week as well. Maybe he'll bring a little bit out in that and I'll let him bring that out as well. So it's dead easy just to say, just sit there and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but we've not been called to sit and keep our mouths shut. We are, we are to be his voice, we're to be his hands, we'll be to his feet. God left us here to be his body. Jesus left us here to be his body. Yes, he's went back to be seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding. He's not sitting up there in the sunshine. But there's sunshine in heaven. He is the light of the world. Hallelujah. It doesn't need the sun to give him warmth. He is who he is. Glory to God. But we are called to be his body here on this earth, to carry on his ministry. It's not a wonderful, wonderful glorious, blessed position that God has given to us, that we have been called here to carry on his ministry. Hallelujah. He works in us and through us and by his spirit, hallelujah. The very same spirit that inhabited Jesus inhabits us, glory to God. And we've been called to be salt and to be light. We need to be that salt and light like never before, especially the days that we find ourselves in. So that's Jeremiah's first question to the Lord and says, Lord, look at all this wickedness. Look at everything that's taking place here. And then God begins to tell him what he's planning, what he's planning to do. God replies. Do you know what I love about this? Here's the prophet's question, but it's the prophet's prayer. And then here's God's answer to prayer. So God will answer your prayer when you cry out to him. And we can just, we'll just not necessarily read through that, but God says, I'm about to raise up a terrible nation. In fact, let's read a little bit. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded for him. I'm going to work, I'm going to, I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though you are told it. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, or which was the Babylonians. I'm going to raise up a terrible nation as part of it and use them as judgment against the apostasy and the wickedness of my people. I'm going to raise up a wicked, wicked nation and I'm going to turn them against my people. It's God's word. So God was going to what, raise them up or he was going to allow a very wicked nation to be raised up to bring devastation, not only to Israel, but to all the surrounding nations. Because Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar went through many nations, conquering them, destroying them. And they were wicked and they were evil and they were feared. People trembled. They were invincible. And it says they moved as fast as lightning and their chariots and, you know, and they were, like, you know, they were just they were phenomenal warriors and they fear, put the fear of death into people. Hallelujah. The Babylonians were coming. And this is what the Lord was revealing to the, the prophet Habakkuk. The Babylonians were coming. Nebuchadnezzar was on his way and he was going to erect an image of gold of himself and he was going to set it up and anybody that refused to worship it was going to be put to death. And this was, the prophet was getting this. We know that Daniel tells us what, what was going to happen when Nebuchadnezzar was coming on the scene. Do you know we could actually see that picture as what's going to take place in the latter days? There is going to be a terrible nation or a terrible army is going to be raised up in the latter days. It's going to be a terrible man worse than Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to have a terrible army. The Bible tells us this. And he's going to come and he's going to set up an image. And just as Nebuchadnezzar says, if nobody bows down and worships that image, he says, you're going to be, you're going to be murdered and you're going to be put into a fire. Hallelujah. And we know that most people, as soon as you heard the music, boof, you were down and you were going to worship. 
No, the book of Revelations in 13, it tells us that when that, the false prophet comes, he's going to erect a huge image. Don't ask me what that looks like. And it says anybody who refuses to bow down to that image, you're going to actually get your, you're going to be beheaded or you're going to be, you're going to be killed. So there's going to be a future again nation going to be raised up. So what we're seeing here, we're going to see something that we are living in today and it's going to be raised up in our midst. In fact, it is probably getting raised up in our midst. It's just that sometimes we're blind and we do not see it. Hallelujah. It's already getting raised up as we begin to speak. Do you remember the Nazis? Remember the Nazi regime? That wasn't that long ago. A terrible nation got raised up and they marched through the nations conquering, devastating, destroying Yes, they brought a great destruction and they sought out the Jews in particular, but I'll tell you this, they, they killed a lot of other people as well. The Polish brought devastation across Europe and they were, and they were planning to come over to our nation. Thank God by the grace of God. But there was a great fight. They had to stand against them. So the Nazis were there and we can look at others that are going to be raised up. But who's coming next? Is there a nation right now being prepared? Could it be United Nations, the UN? Could it be the UN? Could it be NATO? A gathering of nations that actually are being raised up as we speak. I think we tend to look at the, the westernized world as if we're still Christian. We're far from being Christian. A lot of people have, seem to hold America in great esteem. America is probably one of the worst immoral nations that actually is pushing immorality across the world. America. It's America that's pushing pornography and filth. It's America that's pushing a woke agenda. And to our shame, Britain also is pushing a woke agenda. Sexualized filth. Our nation is pushing this. Our nation, Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales and America. They are the world's number one promoters of filth across the world. Thank God there's still a biblical belt in America. But I want to tell you this, there's a lot of filth and evil that is coming from America that is targeting the rest of the world and they are pushing that across the world. I want to just throw now out there, sometimes we, 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 we sometimes we live with kind of blinkers on. That is a fact. And if you don't believe me, just look at, this, just look at the, uh, the Constitution and just look at what our own government that's come to power are promoting even here, the Labour government that's came to power. Look at what they are pushing upon our schools and look at the things they want to bring in. And I've no change from the Tories. I might add, we'll just get more and more the same. God will not sit back forever. And just like here in this book of Habakkuk, the people were just carrying on, carrying on, and there was no any fear of the judgment of God. It just went, it had been on for far too long. It seemed as if God had been just sitting back in the background. God is never just sitting back, friends, idly. I want to tell you this, God is in full charge, although God seems to let something go, but there's always going to be judgment, always going to be judgment. And we see that with Habakkuk here as well, as he stands in the gap and begins to cry out, to the living God. Now he's astounded. So now God tells him what he's going to do. This is what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to raise up this vile nation and I'm going to let that vile nation be my instruments of judgment. We struggle with that, don't we, sometimes? We, we struggle to understand how can God use wickedness for his righteousness and for his judgment sakes? Well, that's what God does. God will do that. God will use whatever he desires to use for his means to bring judgment to a people that they might get turned back again. We'll just read a couple of verses then. So the prophet's second question to God, he says, God, how could you do such a thing? How could you, we've heard about the Babylonians. That's a, they're wicked and evil. How, how could you use them? I, I don't understand this. They're far worse than us. I know we're bad, but they're really bad. It's such a thing, isn't it? I know we're bad, but the guys are really, really bad. I mean, they're far worse than us. How can you use them to bring judgment on us? Surely you would, you would use a righteous person to bring judgment on us. And God says, this is what I'm going to do. And he's astounded by this. He's, 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 he's like torn apart. And then he, he offers up his second question. God, how can you do this? And then he says this. Verse 2, we'll read a couple of verses. He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected hallelujah and then the Lord says this in verse 2 um, Habakkuk 2, 2 then the Lord answered me and said this write the vision make it plain in tablets 
that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. It's this word faith again has really been grabbing me a lot. I know I've spoken on it and not that long ago, but I just another side too as well. It's, but the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. We live by faith, not by sight, but we live by faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I quoted that scripture, got it down here, Second Corinthians 5 and 7. For we live, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith in God. And amongst a corrupt world in which we're living in, but we walk by faith, not by sight. Thank the Lord for that. God is in charge and God's timing is perfect. That's what it says. Don't tarry, wait for it. You ever get fed up waiting for something? You ever been waiting for something in your life and you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. You think, you know, it's this never going to happen and it just comes at the right time, you know. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. You ever been waiting for something? And um, when you've been waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting and it's like, God, is it, you know, and you can get, you can get easily get fed up, don't you? You can get fed up waiting and, you know, you know, but we become impatient. And this was like the prophet Habakkuk. He it was impatient. God, surely, how long will you let this go on? You know, those people probably praying that today as well. You know, Lord, how long will you let all this wickedness go on? How long will you let all this evil that we're seeing now being um, coming upon us? I think sometimes we need to kind of wake up, you know, and some, you know, I mean, my son's helping me just now doing about a decking in the back door. It's a big operation. It's all muck because of this rain. And, um, and, you know, Ben grew up in the church, but he left the church. I'm trusting he's going to come back. But having a good conversation with Ben, I says, Ben, don't you realize how quickly things have changed? He says, Dad, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's amazing. Even he's seen this. It's, people are amazed how things have changed in our nation. How things have changed in Britain. It's amazing. It's like, how near did we ever get to this place that we're finding ourselves here today? And it's just because sometimes we get so accustomed to living amongst it, we don't bat an eyelid well. It's, you know, we can get used to it and, get, and, and then before you know it, it doesn't really have that effect upon us. But to tell you this, things have changed so much, even my son. I said, Ben, this is exactly what God is, says. This is the trajectory we're going. It is the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the days of violence and wickedness. Again, there we're seeing people getting, you know, those little young girls killed viciously. You know, and, and we're seeing more and more than that happen. And then there's that other case, there's children where there was a house fire, but somebody had actually started that fire. And, and that was another case. And, and we could read many other cases time and time again, violence and wickedness and evil and all kinds of filth we're living amongst. And it's so easy just to be saying, well, well, well doesn't cut it, friends. We really need to be crying out to the, to the living God and get that burden again. So God, you need to do something. You need to move. Hence the reason we need to step up our prayers and that prayer means say, God, give us a burden, a burden. There's a place to get to in prayer and I am not there. I've had touches of it. I've had moments of it, but I'm not there. There's a place to get to where you've got that. God gives you that burden and you can cry out, you know. I read about Irish Hills again and again. I read about Irish Hills when I was on in, in a holiday. And just getting that burden, you get that desire. And you say, God, I will not let you go like Jacob. Until you bless me, until you do your mighty work. You know, God has set himself at be, uh, bequest of our prayers. Did you know that? That, that? that our prayers are powerful to move the hand of God. Say, well, God can move. I mean, we'll just sit by and let God do all the work. No, we've got a part to play. We need to get that burden. We need to cry before him and say, God, you need to do something. Hallelujah. I need to get that more from my family as well, my, my children, not only that, but the, my nation of the land of Scotland. I will even include Britain in that there as well. We're British, hallelujah, but although we've got our Scottish flavour and identity. Glory to God. So again, Second Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. Thank God for that. Isaiah 7 and 9, and not all versions say this, but NIV says it, it says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Hallelujah. We're living, we're going, to, we're going into days, friends, honestly, if we don't stand firm in your faith, you're going to collapse. Faith is so, so important. That's what's coming back to me. My faith in God. My faith in God. We need to strengthen our faith. Hallelujah. I've got down here, faith needs to be exercised. Glory to God. If you can't move a twig, don't try and move a mulberry tree 
or a mountain. You'll get that a little bit in Luke 17, 5 and 6 when Jesus was talking. The disciples says, Lord, increase our faith. Because they realized the importance. Jesus kept going on with faith. Lord, increase our faith. And then it came off the back when Jesus was talking about forgiveness. If your friend upsets you and he asks for forgiveness, forgive him. And then he comes back, he does, he does it again and he forgive him again. And then I've got to forgive him again. And we're like, for Pete's sake, I want to thump him. I've had enough, I want to put the boot in. He's like, you know, it's... How often do we, to be forgive, forgive? It's like, oh, this is, un- you know what I mean? It's like once, twice, three times. And I say, I tell you the truth, no, seven times, seven. 70 times, seven. You know, we are called to forgive. And that can be very difficult. You know, we've got that old nature as a party who's want to rise up and, and well, if you can't strike out, but you can give a verbal, a verbal abuse, you know. I mean, you get a lot of that sometimes. I miss that sometimes when somebody can just cut you up in the road and you want to say something, but you can't, you're restrained. And it just lets us know we're still living in this old life, you know, when somebody noises you up and it's like, you know, all of a sudden you that. Forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. So Jesus says, listen, increase with, and Jesus says, listen, I tell you the truth, if you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, and it's like that size, I think. He says, you could say to this mulberry tree, pick yourself up and throw yourself into the sea. And if you do not doubt, it will happen to you. Another verse in somewhere along says, you could say to this mountain, or let's say Conic Hill, Charles, we'll, let, we'll not go for Ben Lomond. Listen, if you can't even move a molehill, don't try and move, the, the, you know, the conic hill. And, and you know, and sometimes it's, we realize that, you know, I mean, you know, let's, 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 be, let's be sensible, you know. But the Lord says, but if you've got faith as small as this, you can move mountains. Glory to God. Faith is powerful. Faith is powerful. Glory to God. I've got down here, faith is like a muscle. It needs to be exercised. It needs to be stretched. It needs also to be tested because you can give a mean test. Brought that out. Hallelujah. Of late, I used to do a little run. I'm just going to use this as a little illustration. And um, and I picked up a couple of injuries. I picked up an injury here in this hip. I thought it was my hip was going. I thought, sack running. I'm I'm not running my way to a new hip. I like this hip. I'm not going to part with it. And then I ended up where it was this calf muscle here was after a kilometer, this thing just seized up in me. And eventually it took me out of action. Uh, this guy that used to be with us, I bumped into this guy again, we had coffee, and he paid for me. He gave me a session to go and see a physio up in Glasgow. The guy's name is Mark. He says, listen, this guy's really good after You need to go and see him, get tested out. And plus he paid for it as well. If I'd quit, shoop, up I went. And um, so there we go. He's, 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 he, you know, he observes you, right? Walk up and down. There we are, I'm walking up and down, and you know, and then he then he says, right, you know, and he's get me to do some wee silly exercises. He's just is this guy at the madam here, you know? So, I'm walking up and down like this, and I'm going like that. What's going on? Then he had me doing the penguin walk. <laughs> Got you been out, uh, and I'm walking up and down. I'm going, I'm thinking to myself, is he at it? See, so having a laugh while I'm getting up and doing doing the penguin walk, and, and I'm doing this. So he identified the problem. He identified the problem and he says, you're not walking properly. How dare you? What do you mean I'm not walking properly? How dare you? So I realized my, my right leg like, kind of turned in a little bit. Now see, sometimes when you watch yourself in videos, I've seen myself walking in videos. I'm like, oh, look, I'm walking weird. <laughs> Every now and again, I mean, I'm not, I've seen that. But when somebody tells, it's all right for me to have, have think that, but when somebody tells you that, and so then he goes, you ever had a massage before? I went, no, I haven't really. He went, right, okay, I'm going to give you a sports massage. I went, a piece of cake. So you've got to strip down in your shorts, you jump up in that little black bed there and face down in a towel, you know. And, and the next minute he starts working on the legs. Honestly, pain, screaming pain. I mean, literally, I'm, I felt as if he was squeezing the muscles out of my leg. I was, what the heck is he doing? I felt as if it was a hammer and chisel job. I don't know what he was doing. And it was like agony and what and all the, the main muscles in, in my leg. And it was like, wow, it was like, I was never so glad in my life when he had finished, you know, I kind of staggered out the, the surgery. And then he gave me some of these exercises to do. <laughs> Sometimes I come into church and I'm up and down here and I'm doing the penguin walking. Got to look straight. And 
So then I was impressed with them. So I actually booked, there was a special deal for six sessions, right? 300 quid. And so I did. I paid the money. You know, it's amazing how much money we pay. I mean, I've had to pay a few quid in my car just recently there. It's amazing how we pay money in my car, my houses and other things, but yet you can neglect yourself. And I just thought to myself, no, I'm going to work on myself, you know. So I started again through this, started running. I'm running further now than I've ever ran because I've got this problem. So, you know, so he's, he's working on the muscles, knocking them in. And he says, no, we need to train you to walk differently. So when we're walking around the island, we land there. So she's keeping an eye on me. Right, no, she goes, not your foot's going in a little bit. So I'm deliberately having to, co- I'm so having to concentrate now to walk differently. Hallelujah. And that takes massive, do you know, do you know the mental effort that takes? It's, it's like, it can be exhausting sometimes because you're so busy concentrating. I need to change the way I walk and, and I need to do things differently and I need to discipline myself to go through this set of exercises, because this man says, I can fix you. And that's what I want to hear. No, that wasn't your hip. There's actually a wee muscle up here, something else and something else. So, so I am decided to say, right, okay, I'm going to get myself in shape and um, for the glory of God. Hallelujah. So I've got one more session to, to go with this man, but it's, it's working. And, um, and I'm thanking God for that. But again, faith is like a muscle. It needs to be exercised, Right? I won't tell you how far I ran in this island when it was hot, but I did. And uh, I mean, at the end, I mean, I'm like, I mean, I'm saturated in sweat and then I just take a plunger into the sea. So I needs to be stretched. I need to stretch myself. I need to be able to go further than I've went before. And that takes effort. And as I says, it can also be tested. I mean, test. If I'm building up muscle now, I should be able to do, run farther. And I should be able to lift more than I've lifted before once I start exercising. So it can be, it can be tested. You know, God will test our faith. Faith is ultimate. As I was speaking to the physio, Mark, I said, you know something? I didn't realize how important muscles were. He says, Arthur, muscles is one of the most important things in your whole body. Hallelujah. Because it takes the strain away from your joints. It takes it up and, and every, you have to build it up because muscles are so important for the body. He says, they're big elastics. He says, and what would happen with minds is they, they, they all get knotted. And they had to now, he, had to, he had to now flex them and get their knots out your muscles. And hence the reason he was doing all this sort of thing. And then he gets a wee machine on you. Goodness <laughs> sake. But we get there, don't you? You just know, this is good for me. This is good for me. Good for me. I feel like green. I can't agree. Can't agree. But I felt like crying, Charles. I really did. I was, I mean, excruciating. You know, but I just thought to myself, this is good for me, but it was painful. It was painful. So I think sometimes in the Christian walk as well, listen, living the Christian walk is painful, brethren, because it's warring against the flesh, and the flesh hates it. The flesh hates it when the Spirit of God starts working on us, like the physio, right, okay. It hates it, and it, and it would get, oh, that's it, fair enough, I'll just stop. We need to go the extra mile, hallelujah. So those who are willing to go the extra mile will come into the deeper places of God. Let me just go up here to 1 Peter. Again, I'm just going to be really just bringing out the importance of faith. Peter here sums it up wonderfully. 1 Peter 1 verse 6 says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and the glory at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, for your faith is being tested. Difficult times comes upon us to test our faith, the genuineness of your faith. You can say faith. You say, I've got faith to I'm blue, to I'm blue in the face. But I want you to tell you this, when all hell breaks in your life, we'll see where your faith is. Will you stand or will you fall? Will you be strong or you will collapse and be weak? Your faith, our faith in God is so, so important. And Peter here says it's far more important than gold. Now that tells me it is important. Our faith in God. My faith in God, my belief. Do I really trust God? Do I really believe in God? And that's what Peter says because our faith is being tested. Just going back, just a little verse back there as well in the book of James 
And it says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So your faith is going to be tested. God will test our faith, hallelujah, to make it stronger. Do you know, sometimes it's only when something gets tested that it becomes stronger. It's like it goes into the fire. So it becomes, a, because I'm a stronger person when I've come through a very difficult time. You ever been through difficult times? I've got two hands up here. I could put a thousand hands up here. I've been, I've been through a lot of really difficult times in my life. I'm talking about those times, though, when you're in God and you go through difficult times. I mean, you've just got to just stand and, you know, I mean, I thank God for the times I've been through, but I want to go back. I want to go back through them again. Honestly, I've been through some terrible times in my life. I won't take bore you with the details. I just wouldn't want you to go through them again, but I thank God for them. Does that make sense? When I look back, it's been the making of me. I'd never realized at the time because I was screaming. <laughs> no, no, just through just the difficulties of life sometimes. At the time I was screaming about it, it was only afterwards, further down the road, that I realized actually that was the making of me. Actually, that actually benefited me a lot at the time. I didn't think so because we don't see that. We, we always see negativity as bad, but actually, negativity in God can be good because it's building me up and making me a stronger person for going through what I did go through. So when you exercise your muscles, guess what? Your body's getting stronger. I'm probably still too weak, actually. <laughs> you watch all that. Some, I mean, somebody paid for me to join the gym as well. The guy that paid for the first session. So I got a membership up at Bowfield. And I, I told you that when I first went up there. And, um, and I go into these wee machines and you get all the big... You get all the guys come in, you know what I mean? They're just muscular hunks, you know. Big mega weights like this, you know. And I, I feel like a wee boy. I, I hide in the corner doing me, doing me tiny things, you know. You've got to build it up. Not that I ever want to get to be Mr. Muscles, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. But do you know what I'm saying? But you have to, so it makes my body stronger when I build up my muscles. How much more then when we exercise your faith that your spiritual man is much stronger? which is far more important. When we exercise our faith in spiritually as a man, my spiritual man, I am far more stronger spiritually because of the things I'm going through when I exercise my faith. We need to exercise faith so much more, so much more, trust in God and believe in God. You know, 1 Peter 5 and 8 says this, and we have to realize we have got an enemy, brethren, and it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. That's 1 Peter 5, 8. Seeking someone that he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. It's interesting as well in the book of Ephesians, when it talks about the armor of God, it talks about the shield of faith. Hallelujah. The shield of faith. Glory to God. God is shielding us in this world by our faith. But let's finish up in Habakkuk again. We'll be started and we'll go to, we'll go back to Habakkuk. And I want to encourage us this morning and um, I really wanted to come back and be a blessing to this beautiful church here at Eastgate Church and all my brethren who I missed. I'm just missing the sunshine now, you know, it's like... And it's at the very end now, you know, where, where God says, listen, God, he, he, he's asking, Lord, how, how could you, you know, how can you use this wicked nation? And God says to him, don't worry, I've, I've got this in hand. Because see that wicked nation, I'm going to deal with them. Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to deal with that wicked empire. I will sort them out. Their, their day is coming. They might get used for a time. I might allow them to be used but he says, but the day is coming when they're going to be held accountable and I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to deal with the whole world. Hallelujah. That day is coming, God's going to deal with the nations in the world. The world thinks it's just getting away with all this wickedness as if it doesn't care. We'll, we'll betide this world. We'll betide this world. Jesus Christ is coming back to this world. And it says, he'll say, mountains, hide this, hide this from the wrath of the Lamb. He's not coming back as a weak and mild man. He's coming back as king as kings. The very look of him will send, will, will send people shivering in their, in, their, in their graves. And he's going to hold, everybody will be held accountable when the Lord of glory comes back again, hallelujah, to receive us, the body of Christ, but he is going to deal with them. And so at the end of that, then the prophet's prayer, he gets that understanding of what the Lord is doing and just we'll go to verse, we're going to finish with three verses, that's at the end. And the heading in the, my New King James here says, a hymn of faith. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. It says this, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will have joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's feet, and he will make me walk on the high hills. Hallelujah. And this is what Habakkuk is doing. Is he's living in the midst of all of this wickedness. And he's living there and he's trying to hold on to his integrity and his faith and trust in God. He says, even though all of this is taking place, even though that, that, that I've got nothing, he says, but I will yet trust in God. Even though my, you know, the crops are failing, even though I've got nothing in the bank, even though all of this, I'm living in this dreadful place, he says, but he says, but this, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. Even though I've got nothing, my faith is strong in God. Hallelujah. So often our faith can be dependent of a good day, am I a bad day? If I get money in the bank, if I'm not getting money in the bank, am I, am I strong, am I healthy? Or am I feeling weak and ill? And sometimes our faith sometimes is going to be dependent on what's taking place in the natural, my natural circumstances or the natural environment. But now here, the, 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 the prophet says, he's looking beyond that. Even though I've got nothing, even though there's nothing there, even though I've not got anything to really put my trust on, even though I'm living in terrible times, but my faith is not in the times. See, we should be living outside the times. Our faith is we should be living in the presence of God. Hallelujah. I should be, I should be living. I'm looking to the Lord. Is it Paul that says in the book of Philippians, and he says, I have learned the secret to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself, whether well fed or whether hungry, whether rich, whether poor, whether sick or whether in good health. He says, Paul, I have learned the secret to be content content in whatever circumstances I face because my faith is not in the circumstances. My faith is in God and God is outside the circumstances. That's why we've been called to live our lives by faith in the spirit, not in the flesh because when we're stuck in the flesh, we're going to be vulnerable. We're going to be battered to and fro. I'm, I'm up, I'm down, I'm, I'm happy, I'm sad, you know, and um, you know, and we get these things. But when we can look beyond that and my faith is now, it's in the Lord regardless of what is taking place. But I'm walking, I'm walking that line with the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, all of this stuff is going on round about me, but my eyes are focused on the Lord. I'm not going to get caught looking at all the things that the devil's doing. I'm looking at heaven. I'm looking at the Lord. This is a season. The Bible says, it's, yes, this is a wicked world. The Bible tells, and it's going to get wickeder if there's such a thing that you could even imagine as we move into these last days. But I want to tell you this, but the glory of God is coming. Hallelujah. There's a beautiful, glorious God who's coming to this earth. And we need to walk today like never before. Can I encourage you, brethren? Let us stand firm in our faith today. Let us build up our faith. Let's begin to trust God more. Whatever circumstances you're in, if you need, if you need healing, let's just keep trusting God for that. But even if I'm not, I'm going to trust God anyway. Hallelujah. I remember just before my marriage, I was, I was really trusting God for something. It wasn't a major thing, but to me it was major. Amen. I suffered from a condition called Rainer's disease. My hands used to go dead red, red. See, when I get hot, and it was just, it was a circulation problem, and smoking didn't help, and I was smoking everything for all kinds of substances. And it was the worst thing I could do, but I didn't know that. And, and see, when I used to get hot, my hands used to go bright red. I mean, bright red. I used to go lie and clench my fist. I could hear the pulse beating in my hand. Boof, 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 boof. Remember the wee Tom and Jerry thing? It was like, boof. I could do that. See, my hands go like that, and that blood's all pumping. In. I can go like that and just shut my fist, and I can count my pulse, no problem. Bum, 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 bum. But my hands are far better now than never were. Hallelujah. But it was called raining. But see, then I was so embarrassed by this. So embarrassed. I was getting married in the church. I went, God, please heal me. Father, please heal me. Because I knew it's very important. I'm going to be there. And hands were very forefront. And I'm going to have to get a ring and put it in my wing's hand. And she was going to have to put a ring and put it in my hand. And my hands were going to be, everybody's going to be looking at that. And I'm so conscious in my hands. I'm saying, God, please heal me, heal me. I get prayed for in time and time and time again. And I was too embarrassed to go up for any more prayer after I went like that. Well, there's no faith in that if you're going to keep getting up. So anyway, it was, it was getting nearer the day, nearer the day. And I was going, God, please. And then I thought, right, I want the church nice and cool. We used to meet in Living Waters Christian Centre and they met in a circle. <laughs> the, the seat, remember Janice? The seats in the circle, Ben Patu used to swing around. You know? And the place used to be like an oven and I went like, guys, could we just put the seats out like this? Could we have the doors open and put the heat down? Praise the Lord. I turned up. The seats were all in a circle. The place was like an oven. 
an oven. I was looking off that air-conditioned bus in Lanzarote there. Since I go, pff, pff. And I went, I, my worst nightmare was before me. And there was nothing I could do about it. Everything was outside my there. And my hands were like, like red. And I'm standing there and, and then I could feel my face getting, you ever you get embarrassed and your face starts getting red? But you know something? You just have to stand there and give glory to God and trust God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whatever it is, we stand firm in the Lord and we just keep trusting God. Hallelujah. I don't care what happens to me now. I'm just trusting God and keeping my eyes upon the Lord. Whether he heals me or whether he doesn't heal me. Whether, whether I end up with a lot of money or whether I end up with no money. What's that got to do with life? Paul says whether I've got money or whether I've not got money. Whether I'm in prison or what I'm not in prison. He says, I know what it's like to be in constant contentment before the Lord. Why? Because his faith was in God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we need to build up our faith. Hallelujah. We need to be strong in faith because the days that we are living in just now are just constantly coming against us. And we need to be a people of faith. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible speaks so much about faith. Jesus says, when I come back, I think you'll find that in Luke 8. Yes, you will. He says, well, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on the earth? It's faith that moves mountains. It's faith that moves the hand of God. Glory to God. It's faith in this great and glorious God. Hallelujah. And every single one of us is given a measure of faith. We need to bring it and exercise and start to trust God for the bigger things in life. Amen. Whatever they may be. Glory to God. Father, I just thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord God, for the faith. Father, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet unseen. Father, I pray, help us to be a people of faith this morning. Father, Lord, increase our faith. Even the disciple says, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, I pray, help us increase our faith. Lord, build us up in faith. Give us revelation of faith. Help us, Lord, to trust you for bigger and, bigger and better things. Help us, Lord, to begin to move mountains instead of molehills. Help us, Lord, to, Father, to be that people that you've called us to be, a people of faith. Father, we thank you, Lord, Father, for those faith in God. Faith in God, Father. The enemy hates faith and he will attack it, Lord. For Jesus says, for all things are possible for them that believe. Hallelujah. Nothing will be impossible for them. Hallelujah. Nothing will be impossible. Lord, you're building a people of faith in Jesus' glorious name. So I just pray blessings, Father, upon us this morning. And bless us as we go through this life, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all get to the spiritual gym and then begin to work up um, a storm in faith. Glory to God. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.